All of us face problems of some sort or other every day. Sometimes it's the shower dying to trickle just when you have soaped yourself for a bath. At other times, it could be electricity going off when you are watching your favorite program on television. In fact, problems have become so much a part of life that one wonders what life would be like if there were no problems. At work too, problems arise every day, day after day. So much so that executives often wonder, what am I, merely a problem-solving machine? The truth, however, is that it's in the handling of problems that executives show their real worth. If work just went on without any problems, all that would be necessary are progress monitors. Problems are what keep executives in their jobs, constantly endeavoring to solve problems, to come out with better solutions, to improve effectiveness. So while for most of us, problems are looked upon as hassles, irritants, impediments, obstructions to smooth functioning, in managerial situations, a problem is an opportunity, something to do, something challenging, something positive, presenting an executive with a chance to show his management skill, to improve performance. In a managerial situation then, a problem is not just a problem, it's a positive opportunity. A problem is a positive opportunity. To understand this concept of positive opportunity, as against everyday hassles, let's take a small problem and solve it. A problem, an irritant that all of us face at some time or other. A leaking tap, going drip, 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 driving us crazy. Every problem has associated symptoms, what we observe. So, first of all, we observe the symptoms. Only a trickle in this case, the water dripping from the tap. To resolve which, we must find out what is wrong with the tap. In other words, what causes the symptoms? Is the tap closed properly? Yes, it is. Let us then check the washer. Has the tap assembly become loose? Have the knob and threads worn out? The exercise we are carrying out is what is called gathering all the facts. We consider all the facts, then identify the specific problem. So, if the washer is defective, our problem is defective washer and not leaking tap. Similarly, in case the tap assembly is defective, the problem gets stated as defective assembly. Remember, not leaking tap. What we're going to do first is to eliminate symptomatic causes till we are left with the essential problem. We narrow down the problem to its essentials. We define the problem in terms of various causes responsible for observed symptoms. Then we go about solving the by now well-defined specific problem, either by replacing the washer or changing the assembly or whatever. This action in management terms is called making and implementing a decision. After this remains one very important step, check that it has worked. That is, we go back to the symptom. Has the leaking tap stopped leaking? Expressed at its simplest, there are three basic steps in tackling a problem. One, define what needs to be done. Two, implement it. Three, check that it has worked. Obviously, these simple statements hide a whole lot of processes that we go through in defining, analyzing, and solving a problem. However, it's useful to remember what is called the problem-solving process. 
The first point to note, of course, is that if the check revealed that the solution has not worked, the entire process has to be gone through all over again. So problem analysis and solving is more like a circle than a straightforward line. There is rarely a sequence as simple as a straightforward beginning and a clear-cut end. The other important and vital point to note is step two, implement it. It conceals a whole lot of processes that we'll shortly examine. Let's go back to the common everyday problem we just discussed, the tap. It's only after we examined the symptoms and gathered all the facts that we were in a position to make a decision on what was to be done. Let's for example say that the tap assembly was defective and thus required changing. The decision to change the tap assembly would be step one in the problem solving process. That is, define what needs to be done. Let's now come to step two, implement it. We would have to take a whole lot of constraints into consideration. Some of them could be, when do I change the tap assembly? In the morning, before I go to office, or later on in the evening after I return? Do I do it myself or call in a plumber? Or should I have it replaced during the day when very often there is little or no water in the main line and thus water wastage would be minimal? In simpler terms, we generate alternatives and then make a choice. The question may arise, why generate so many alternatives? Just go in for the best. But is there ever a best solution to a problem? It is an interesting point and most management experts agree that there is rarely, if ever, a best or only solution. A best solution would imply that the problem is over and done with, permanently solved. But as we all know, in real life, even putting a new tab will only temporarily solve the problem. In course of time, water will leak again. To come back to the problem solving process, we now proceed to step three, check that it has worked. Has our action in implementing a decision about the tap helped? Is the tap working fine now? If it is, we have successfully solved the problem of the tap. From this simple example of a tap, let's move to a management problem and examine the problem analysis and decision making process. This is the problem solving process. This soft drinks factory is having a problem. Workers are in place on the factory floor. The concentrate is ready. Their production, however, is not keeping pace with market demand. Dealers are pressing the factory for more supply. The ongoing heat wave, it seems, has generated tremendous demand for their product. How to meet the situation? A problem. A positive opportunity something challenging, something to solve. Can we display management skills to solve this problem? Deep, I've been getting calls from the dealers. They're saying that they don't have enough bottles coming out to meet the market demand. Well, what's happening here? What is the problem? I really don't know, sir. The plant is working all fine, as you can see. I got the engineer to check and has his report saying that things are absolutely fine. No, no, but some irate consumers have also rung me up to say that they're not getting their favorite drink. I think the problem, sir, lies with the washery. We're not getting enough bottles through from them. Well, let's go and investigate what the problem is. Okay. This is a symptom that there is something wrong. A problem exists. Where do you think the problem could be? In production, raw material supply, faulty or malfunctioning machinery, or in marketing? Let's see how this management team goes about gathering all the facts in this problem-solving process. Is there something wrong with the bottle washing machines? Why aren't there enough bottles on the filling line? The machinery is perfectly all right, sir. All the bottles which come back from the salesman are put into the washery immediately. There is no delay in our department. Sir, what's your phone? Okay, let's go. Please look after this. I'll just check what the phone call is all about. 
Hello? Yes, yes, general manager speaking. I'm not getting enough bottles. Please do something. The dealers are also threatening to stock Drinko, our main competitors, in case their demands are not met in time. Please don't get upset. We are doing our best. Yes, yes, you must do something, quickly. Well, I am trying my best. I assure you that we will solve this problem. Anji, thank you. Yes, please send in the production and sales managers. Thank you. And also the finance manager, please. Thank you. What do you think these managers will now do? They'll first gather all the facts to be able to specify the problem. Here they come. The production manager, the sales manager, and the finance manager. Gentlemen, let us put our heads together. We must step up the availability of our product in the market. The distributor is complaining, even the dealers are annoyed, and even some consumers have rung me up to express their dissatisfaction. Now this is surely a symptom of our problem. I can assure you, sir, that our plant is working very well. I have personally checked the functioning of the concentrate mixing plant, the carbonator, and the automatic bottle capping machine. They're all perfect. Sir, our sales are as good as last year's. However, this year there is a heat wave and the demand for our product has shot up. Therefore, we need to step up production. I do wish I could suggest how. No, I, I think we must all concentrate... Remember, a problem is a positive opportunity. Something challenging to do. That's why they are all here, to solve their problem. Deep, how many shifts are we working? Are all our workers presenting themselves regularly or is there some absenteeism due to the heat wave? We are currently working two shifts, sir. But these shifts are actually at about 80% capacity. The staff is all present. The problem is that there are not enough empty bottles. So the washery people are complaining that many empty bottles are coming back with chipped necks. Therefore, they are being discarded. They may explode or burst while being filled with a drink or while being carbonated. The chip next is not really a new problem. Every year we lose a substantial amount of money in replacing such bottles. In fact, let me see. Last year, we spent about rupees 50,000 replacing such bottles. Yes, our salesmen have noticed that the retailers often use substandard bottle openers. Even last year I suggested that we supply them with good quality bottle openers with our logo. We would ensure two things advertising our product and ensuring low breakages of bottles. Hold it, son. I appreciate your concern, but let's get our figures right first. 50,000 rupees means uh, how many bottles? 25,000 bottles, sir. And do remember, each bottle has a turnaround life of about 15 fillings. 25,000 bottles means 1,000 crates, and 15 fillings, that means about 15,000 crates. Uh, at a market price of rupees 40 per crate. Uh, do you realize that we actually lose something in the range of 6 lakh rupees revenue? See, I told you, give the retailers bottle openers. Let's not get carried away. It's an interesting point. I think we must introduce this bottle opener scheme. Even if it costs about 2 rupees per opener, and we distribute about 20,000 openers, we will still be saving money in the long run. Thank you, Christopher. Good suggestion. But let's get down to the immediate problem first. It seems certain that our production is not a problem. The, uh, what is our position at the moment on the inventory on raw materials? No problem at all, sir. We can meet additional production requirements up to 20%. Hmm, good. And Christopher, what is the situation with our transport fleet? Uh, our salesmen have given excellent reports on the new trucks. The old trucks are doing just as well. We are managing up to four trips per truck every day. No, there's no transport problem. Good. You'll recall that while examining the tap, we went through the entire process of checking every part of the tap. Similarly, the managers here are going through the production and marketing stages to gather their facts, analyze, and eliminate all that is not a problem. What will remain is the specific problem needing a solution. It's also encouraging to note that the general manager is asking questions, not offering solutions. He's doing what Peter Drucker, father of the management sciences, would approve of. 
According to Drucker, the most common source of mistakes in management decisions is the emphasis on finding the right answer rather than the right questions. Drucker goes on to say that the search for the right question would involve ask why the problem has arisen, ask how the problem manifests itself, seek additional information if it will help clarify the situation. Can you recognize the right questions being asked by these managers? Let us review our discussion so far. The specific problem now seems to be quite clear. Production is not a problem. Transport is again not a problem. Staff is present. Raw material stock is good. The machinery is also all in good working order. The specific problem really then turns out to be not enough bottles. We need to step up our marketing capacity and for that we need more bottles. Are we not really saying that more of our product is required in the market? Why do we talk only in terms of bottles? Maybe we can put our product in cans or polythene bags like milk that's now commonly available. It would mean an investment of almost about 50 to 60 lakh of rupees, besides which the machinery would have to be imported. No, no, what is more important is that cans or polythene packages don't meet our criteria, which are really threefold at the moment. First, we need a fast solution. Two, we need to minimize costs or additional investment. And three, we need to maximize profits. So more important, we do not know if the Indian market will accept cans or polythene packs. We have not conducted any market research. I still think we should stick to bottles. At this stage, we'd like to introduce you to what in management is called a decision tree. A decision tree depicts visually and graphically the different options available for solving a problem. Let's make a decision tree. The first matter that has been decided is that our specific problem is to increase our product on the market. In other words, a marketing capacity problem. So far in the discussion, alternative packaging methods have been discarded as not viable. So we do not proceed. Can we not subcontract our bottling? Hmm. That's a point, no doubt. But do you think there are others with sophisticated machinery like us? I'm sure we'd be compromising our high standards. We must keep production within our own factory. To come back to our decision tree, we have also discarded subcontracting. So we do not proceed. Sir, if we cannot change our system of production, if we cannot subcontract, then we must buy more bottles and step up our own production. How many more bottles do you need? Well, looking to our shortfall, I think I'm certain that we need at least 6,000 crates. Here, we are going to run up against a constraint. 6,000 crates means about a lakh and a half of bottles. That would mean a mid-season investment of about 3 lakh rupees. Just uh, check our budget for emergency contingencies, please. I think we can't spare more than a lakh of rupees. That's about 2,000 crates. Deep, will you be able to meet the additional production in just two shifts? Yes, sir. As I told you earlier, we're running at about 80% capacity. There is no problem stepping up production within our two shifts. And Christopher, what is our transport situation? Sir, the larger trucks can carry 550 crates at a time. The smaller trucks carry 350 crates. So what we are really talking about is a few additional trips per day. This can easily be managed. Then let us review the position. Ideally, we want 6,000 crates. But that does not meet our criteria of minimal costs and maximum profits. We are constrained by our financial requirements. What could be the optimal solution? 2,000 crates at a cost of 1 lakh rupees? Absolutely. And I'm certain that uh, the investment would be recovered from the higher sales. Uh, besides, which, it would not also substantially affect the money position within the company. It would mean higher revenue. I think it's a good decision. Good. It's wise to remember that most managerial problems do not have a best or only solution. One is often to settle for something that suits the circumstances, but which is less than ideal. However, is the best possible solution and is thus referred to as optimal solution. 
Let's see how the decision tree is now structured. Alternative packaging and subcontracting have been rejected. The decision is to get more bottles by purchasing them. An ideal solution required purchase of 6,000 crates. However, keeping the constraints in mind, they have decided to buy 2,000 crates. This then is the optimal solution. Have we examined the risks in this solution? What if it suddenly starts raining and, and the heat wave dies down? Do you think the bottle manufacturers will deliver in time? I think, sir, there are reasonable risks to take. After all, without some risk, nothing is gained. <laughs> well, we are introducing your 20,000 bottle openers as well. I hope that makes you happy, Daruwala. <laughs> now that the decision has been made, it has to be implemented. Thus, the orders for the bottles have to be placed, production geared up, bottle openers ordered and distributed, and so on. In plain terms, step two of the problem-solving process, implement it. We still have one important step left. Check that it has worked. Hello, Christopher. Hello, sir. How are things here? So everything is in excellent order. We are managing several extra trips a day. Really? The bottle opener scheme is a brilliant success. Well, the bottle crisis seems to be well nigh over then. Even the production line is moving very well indeed. Thank you. Hello, sir. How are things? Sales are excellent. Everyone is very happy. The dealers, the consumers, everyone. Except my nephew. Nephew? He says all his friends want bottle openers. <laughs> Could you give me an additional 50? <laughs> well, distributor sir, as a special gesture to you, we will do this also. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's review what we have gone through today. Remember, one, see that there is a problem. Two, define it. Three, specify. Four, generate possible solutions. Five, define criteria for making decisions. Six, look for optimal solution. Seven, make the decision. Eight, implement it. Nine, check that it has worked. This sequence is at the heart of all approaches to problem solving, be it a leaking tap or a bottling plant, a production problem, marketing problem, or even a labor or personal problem. Remember, define what needs to be done implement it and then check that it has worked.